welcome to Half Past Capitalism, um, episode three. Great, great uh, title. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm really excited to be here with uh, Sam Gindin. Uh, Sam is the author or the co-author of several books, which should, the, the titles of which should give you a sense of where he's coming from. So one is the making of global capitalism: the political economy of American empire. Uh, the Socialist Challenge Today, In and Out of Crisis, The Global Financial Meltdown and Left Alternatives, Global Capitalism and American Empire. So th those are just some of the titles that he's co-authored. Um, he's also written some really thoughtful articles about what socialism actually looks like uh, and how to get there, uh, some of which have shown up in Jacobin Magazine and, uh, and their theoretical journal, uh, Catalyst. Um, and the one that really caught my attention was called Chasing Utopia, which is a critique of cooperatives uh, as a pathway to economic transformation. Um, so welcome, Sam. Good to be here. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, so I guess um, I like to start just, just to, you know, because these things are super abstract uh, and the concept of capitalism is uh, to, by asking what is, what was your most recent sort of personal experience of capitalism? Wow. <laughs> uh, it's so ubiquitous that it's always there. Uh, I mean, obviously the pandemic uh, is an example of uh, uh, not just how unprepared we were to deal with the pandemic, uh, but also how unprepared we were in terms of having the equipment and the vaccines for which we depended on corporations are making profits and whether they consider this something that they should be preparing for because it's social, the social risk or whether the financial risk, which is how they think, made it worth it. And we weren't prepared for that. But I think it's also an indication of what we face with the environment. If we're so unprepared for a virus, uh, it tells us an awful lot about how unprepared we are for something actually infinitely worse and that you're not going to solve with social distancing or lockdowns or vaccinations. So I, I think almost everything that happens daily is a reminder of what capitalism is. Like people live in permanent insecurity outside of the pandemic in terms of their jobs and how precarious everybody's work is, not just so-called precarious workers, the incredible inequality. I mean, it's just something people face Every day, you, you wait for a bus and you worry about the service. How come my area doesn't get the service? So I, I don't think there's anything that capitalism doesn't touch. And is there any particular sort of, uh, just on a personal level, any particular experience of capitalism that makes you think like, um, or that, that, that kind of evokes a particular image of how socialism would be different uh, in your view? Uh, again, I, I, I think everything, I spent most of my life in the trade union movement. Um, and I, I think the actual essence of capitalism is that it, it's fundamentally undemocratic. And I don't just mean by the way the state works or bureaucracy. I mean, the essence of capitalism is some people have to turn their own labor power into a commodity. They sell it, somebody else controls it. Uh, and what you're controlling basically is people's creativity, their ability to do, their ability to collectively do. And so uh, that affects how you develop, what gets produced, uh, what your potentials are in the future. Because if, if all you're learning to do is, uh, you know, turn a bolt on something, you're not gonna learn how to run the world. So capitalism is at its core undemocratic in that sense. It tries to compensate you by uh, giving you some power to consume. Uh, which also makes you dependent on your work. So, so it's the daily undemocratic nature of capitalism that points to a different world in which people actually control their potential capacities and develop those capacities, which don't get developed under capitalism. And that's why making, you know, that's what makes socialism possible. It's something you have to create. It isn't something to take off a shelf and say, well, we got elected, let's implement it. So it's that contrast between losing and giving up that ability to do and create and the possibility of doing that in a different kind of society, which also means creating that different kind of society, that socialism has to be made and we've got the potential to make it. 
And is there any is there any sort of specific personal experience that 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 embodies that for you? Or uh, I mean, I, I guess you, you live in the world of of analyzing global capitalism, so it's it's it maybe a tough question to bring it down. But well, uh, but I'm curious. No, I, I think I think that working in the union, working with uh, working people, uh, it's something that I saw regularly. I saw people with amazing potentials that would occasionally come out. And that's what would keep you going. You'd say, hey, people actually develop, they change. You didn't think they had this in them. Uh, on the other hand, you see the frustrations because that isn't what their daily life is like. And you know, what you see under capitalism is that workers are dependent on capital. That's what they learn every day. They're dependent on whether the corporation wants to invest more or whether it wants to close the plant. Uh, they're pressured to think about the short term, not the long term. They're exhausted, they don't have time to sit around. They might have time to sit around and daydream, but they don't have time to sit around and read and think about how you might actually get someplace else. Um, you're fragmented. You can't solve these problems by yourself. You can't even solve them through the union. You know, you're, the, the class is fragmented along every line, different workplaces, different incomes, different realities, ethnic, race, everything. And so capitalism is actually teaching people that nothing is possible by their daily life. I'm not even talking about propaganda and the media. I'm just talking about what you experience daily. And that's what I saw, that it makes people feel fatalistic. They used to be bought off. It used to be the capitalism used to have to say, we better give them something. And that kind of ended. Thatcher kind of symbolized that with uh, saying there is no society and saying, basically, we don't have to buy people off anymore. We just have to tell them that there's no alternative. And capitalism teaches that, you know, teaches you that every day. Everything just seems so big: globalization, neoliberalism, finance. Uh, so, one of the questions is, why would people even think that another world is possible, given their daily experiences? And that's what makes socialism so difficult. You have to, um, you have to get people to act as if it's possible, but you need to give them some examples. And I think, you know, it's kind of where you're heading to, in a way, with a discussion of co-ops. Um, you have to have struggles that they learn things from. You know, in struggles, you can learn the opposite. You can say, shit, we went on a five-week strike. We didn't get anything. So what you learn is it isn't possible. You know, the trick is, and why you need political organization, is for people to help you frame it. Every time you have a struggle under capitalism, at best, it's a partial victory. So there's always a question of framing it. Well, this is part of something larger. The reason you lost is you didn't build enough solidarity or you didn't fight for you know, more control over investment. And so it's always a question of trying to frame the world for people because you're always trying to escape what capitalism teaches them on a daily basis. And that's what's so powerful about neoliberalism. Let me just give you a very concrete example about it. When, you know, In the absence of structures that they can work through with some confidence, what do people do? They always wanna survive. So they work overtime, they go into debt, their kids at university have a part-time job, their spouse gets a full-time job. Uh, in other words, you're solving the problem individually, you even as for lower taxes. So you, you get some more income. You're solving your problems individually and in a sense that reinforces uh, neoliberalism. And the trick is to get people to understand and appreciate and believe in the possibility that collectively we can actually create new possibilities, but that requires structures, that requires organization. And that's where a socialist party is so fundamental because it's a space to think about that. It's a space to psychologically make you feel like you're part of something that even if you lose your particular battle is fighting for something larger. So these are big questions. I mean, there's reasons for why we haven't gotten very so far. Yeah, but, I mean, but, you, but so, so you really you really feel like the the lack of structure or a lack of a space is really that's that's really um, I mean it sounds like what you're saying is that's the main enabling factor um, that's missing for yeah for people I, I, to I be able wanna, to think outside of capitalism and, and imagine something other than that that kind of grind. Yeah, I mean, no, I I I, I don't want to do say it crudely, but I mean, I guess. You know, people need experiences in their life that gives them some hope. You know, and sometimes I remember Bob White saying to me when I first started working at the union, uh, whenever there's a strike, workers become philosophers. 
And I thought it was kind of an amazing thing to say because what he was saying is they're wandering around in a circle with a picket sign and suddenly they're talking to other people on the line, which you can't do at work. And they ask them about their family. They ask them about what dreams they have. They ask them about, uh, you know, when they started working in the factory, is that where they expected to end up? Uh, and so, uh, you know, struggles potentially have that impact. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's having counterexamples in your daily life. The reason that structures are so important is because it comes back to the fact that it is so overwhelming, everything you're facing. You know, even in a struggle, you're only trying to improve your wage and then you go back the next day after a victory. And often there's a low. Often, you know, you won and you feel good about a shit. We proved we could do something. And then you go back to the daily grind and you say, hmm, uh, you take over a plant. And then two weeks later, uh, well, what if they give in on something and you're back to work? Well, you know, what you see is, hey, I don't really have any power. Uh, so, uh, you know, the trick is how do you, you know, it's not that people have false consciousness. It's that they're responding to what's actually happening in their lives. Right. So the trick is how do you get them to have hope? And part of that is having a vision. But a vision itself, you know, if they don't think it's possible, then it's just a nice thing. So you need a vision, but you need ways to struggle uh, that can bring, you know, bring that vision to the fore. And you need to develop your own capacities and you have to develop them. You know, by that, I mean, you know, it's about learning to understand the world, analyze it, understand it, assess it, evaluate it, uh, how to talk to other people, how to have debates and learn from them instead of yell at each other, how to organize, how to strategize. And how do you learn all those things? And, you know, the point of structures is that this is where you learn them. This is where you have a collective memory. This is where you interact with other people who've gone through other things. Because it's, it's, you know, you asked me about my daily experience. Well, it's really about collecting everybody's daily experience and saying, what does that teach you? I, I, I remember, if you've got time, I'll give you an example. Uh, we were doing educationals and one of the uh, uh, instructors couldn't come. And it was with a fisherman in Newfoundland. So we had a fisherman who had been working with us organizing the Great Lakes fishermen. And we asked him to go down and do the class. So he walked into the class and he told everybody to throw out their books. First thing he did. And then he said, uh, why are we here? I don't mean, don't tell me about God and everything else. I, I, I mean, what are we doing here? What is our lives about? And these are people with, a lot of them have not much of an education. And nobody had asked them that. Nobody respected them enough to ask them that. And the reason that he could ask it was that he thought he knew that fishermen who are out in the ocean uh, in a storm or at night start thinking about what is life about. And they look at the stars and how big things are and where, they, where do they fit in. And often they're actually listening to things like ideas on the CBC because they actually do think. And his message to them was, um, I want to hear what you all say. And then when you're done, I'm gonna tell you the right answer. So they all went around the room and they gave their philosophical thoughts and they were terrific. And then he said, you know, the right answer is that none of us actually know individually. It's only when we get together and discuss this from all our experiences and put them together that we start moving towards an answer. So he was trying to give them that sense of a collectivity, of a space to do this, of their right to do this and need to do this and ability to do this. And it was a brilliant educational lesson. So that, that's where this question of structures come in. They're spaces and they're also psychological supports. You're not alone. It's easy to get depressed when you look at the world. So I think the question of structures is absolutely crucial, but then the question is what kind of structures? So that they're democratic, they're not overly centralized, they're not bureaucratic and structures can just integrate people as well. Social democratic parties are about making your gain within capitalism if possible. And that used to actually be quite, it used to be possible to make gains before. And now we're living in a period where unless you're, the options are more polarized. Unless you're really ready to think big, it's very hard to win small. So, so that's, that's an amazing story. And I, and I feel like it really sets up um, what, I wanted to ask you about, which is, you know, the sort of the, the core, the core of why I invited you on half past capitalism, which is to talk about the, your sort of critique of cooperatives. Um, 
And I mean, it seems to me that cooperatives are a place where you can have those kinds of conversations because if you're in like a worker owned enterprise, for example, um, you actually are able to create a, a workplace where, uh, where you are valued, not just as a, an automaton who can complete a task and go home at the end of the day uh, and collect a exploitative paycheck, but you're actually involved with your with your whole being and, and you know or you at least it's possible for that to be the case uh, even if you're still dealing with the constraints of capitalism in terms of market discipline and so on you're you're you have control over how your workplace is arranged and you have a certain amount of agency and that that agency and i think the theory i i think of a lot of people who are you know see co-op cooperatives as potentially as a sort of potential agent of liberation or an engine of liberation is that they think that um, that 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 experience can then be generalized and you can say okay well if I if we can do this in our workplace then we can do it for all of society uh, and 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 those people become you know you can build solidarity between different parts of the labor movement worker co-ops being one part and and other you know solidarity with other workers um, with other kinds of causes people are just more likely to 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 use the, the profits from a business to invest in their communities and so on. Um, so, so I think that's the positive part, but, but I think you have some really pretty pointed things to say about the, the limitations of that and, and the, or sort of where that goes off track uh, and tell me more about that. Yeah, so I, I guess I just wanna be clear when you introduce me as uh, opposing co-ops. I mean, one question is, what kind of co-ops are we talking about? Because 90% of, I, I don't just mean, I mean, 90% of co-ops are actually consumer co-ops or credit co-ops. They're not about controlling uh, your workplace and your life. So, so there's a different criticism when you say, uh, you know, some major corporation that just decided to give workers some pr uh, profit sharing checks or some uh, stock. And often those kinds of things aren't about, they have nothing to do with control. In fact, they're about integrating workers. In fact, to make it even more crude, it's often about keeping a union out by giving workers something, or if there is a union, uh, getting concessions and asking workers to buy it because we're gonna give you some stock in the company and you may get it back later. So we have to really be clear about what kind of co-ops, what kind of worker involvement we're talking about. And that's critical because there's a lot of evangelical stuff about this, uh, these other things, which, which have nothing to do with transforming capitalism. So I, that's one thing I'd say. I guess the other thing occurs to me is the title of your program, which I, I hadn't realized until you said it, but half capital, half ca halfway to, ca ha what is it again, half? Half past capitalism. Half past capitalism. Yeah, you have to think about whether, you know, the limits of partial measures is, is always a crucial question. Sometimes partial measures um, can be harmful or, or can't get you there. So you skipped over it, but the context in which you're doing this is absolutely vital. If you're taking over workplaces, um, uh, you know, in, in a highly competitive environment, and that highly competitive environment says, uh, well, if you really want to survive, you're going to have to behave like us. Well, that's a real problem. That's just not a, it's not just a side effect. It's why when you actually look at co-ops, a lot of them uh, try to move into sectors where competition isn't a factor. Or, you know, because of lifestyle, you, you, you're ready to accept a lower wage, coffee shops, you know, book, uh, a bookstore. So you have to think about those things, that the context is so important because you can end up, and, and there's an important lesson there. The lesson there isn't that co-ops are bad, but that you have to change the context as well. So for example, uh, uh, you know, you look at the, Argent the takeovers in Argentina. Uh, well, it was very impressive. You know, I would be fully supportive of, you know, workers uh, losing their jobs and thinking about what they do next. And they say, shit, let's take this over. Well, I would completely defend that. The question is, is it a strategy? for winning the world, or is it a defensive strategy that you should support because people are fighting back? So it raises a lot of questions. One question is, uh, if you're gonna start changing the world, would you take over what capital doesn't want? Or would you take over the, the heights of the economy, the most important things? 
Are you going to go to the margins and start a credit union? Or are you going to take over the banks? You know, are you going to say maybe we can make um, a component for the auto industry, or maybe we should take over General Motors? You have to ask yourself those questions. What are you taking over? And if you're taking over the duds, if you you know, if it's kind of a lemon socialism, we're going to take over what capitalism doesn't want. Uh, you can see workers doing it because what else, what other choice do those workers have? But it's not a strategy. And I, I would distinguish between that, doing something to defend yourself versus a strategy. You know, we had the example after the last financial crisis at Republic Windows. It was, uh, UE was the union, uh, very militant union. They had militant local leadership. Uh, and uh, the company wasn't going to get its finances, so they were going to fold. Workers took it over. But what do you do with windows? You have to sell them and you have to sell them in competition. So there was 240 workers and everybody you know, cheered this on, which I thought was great. It should be cheered on, but making it into an answer is different. So one question is, well, how do we spread this everywhere? Is this gonna be an example that excites everybody? Well, it didn't because to excite everybody, you have to go out and organize. You have to say, hey, this is happening. Why don't you do it? And talk about, can you do it? And what would you do with it if you did it? Um, so first of all, you immediately have the question of organizing for it to spread. It doesn't spread automatically. People are too demoralized. They've been defeated too long. Then you have the question of what do you do with it? And uh, everybody talked about it when it happened and then stopped talking about it. And it's one of the things that bothers me. We have to be sober about it and actually analyze and follow these things up. What happened with them is that uh, the 240 workers ended up to be 17 workers. So that's all the business they could get. The 17 workers, were no longer covered by the minimum wage, which was already lousy in the States because they were a co-op. So what we should have been doing is saying, well, why did that happen? And then you get into strategic questions. You know, do we have to change the context? Do we have to take over industries where the government can be the buyer and push them to do it? Hospital equipment, again, book publishing. Uh, so, you know, they found that in uh, Argentina as well. They needed the state involved. You know, one thing in Argentina was that um, they declared them legal co-ops, which meant that they were actually liable for the debts of the company. So when they took them over, not only did they get rundown equipment because capital was moving out, they suddenly owed all this money. And then, you know, if they didn't do that, they accepted it because if they didn't do that, if they didn't have any legal ownership, uh, they couldn't borrow money. Nobody would lend you money unless there were assets. So, you know, they faced these questions immediately. The, the, co the uh, takeover plant that I visited in uh, Buenos Aires was uh, uh, making blenders. They couldn't compete with China. In that case, Argentina actually put tariffs up on the China things as emergency tariffs, and that allowed them to survive. And you're right about the good things they did. They were great on uh, equalizing things within the workplace. They are great on health and safety questions. They actually cooperated on the work. You know, when you're working for a capitalist enterprise, you're always trying to protect your knowledge. Because if you give them all the knowledge, they always take advantage of it. They'll use it to make you work harder. They'll use it to lay off people. But here, nobody was worried about that. So they all just cooperated. Uh, so, you know, there's those positive things and it shows you the potentials. But then it raises those big questions. Well, what do you do about competition? What do you do about free trade? What do you do about corporations having the right to move? What do you do about the fact that you're taking over the weakest parts of the system? And what you found was that it didn't spread, uh, that workers either didn't feel capable or didn't think it was impressive enough. So a lot of them survived. I mean, a lot of workers felt like this is better than nothing. It's better than working for somebody else. And that was fine, but it didn't become a model. It didn't lead to Argentinian workers saying, let's do this everywhere. Because then you have to talk about, you know, so the positive thing, the reason that socialists have to be involved is that there's a tendency, and I think here I am critical of the left, there's a tendency to find examples and cheerlead them, which is this is the new model. And when they fail, we move to another model. And we do this with countries. It's Venezuela one day, then it's Bolivia. The real point about these international stuff is we should show international solidarity, but the real point is these are experiments. Let's learn from them. And let's learn the good, you know, in terms of what you're saying. 
what did they do? You know, they actually showed that, hey, workers can actually run a factory. Let's do the good and then learn, talk about the limits. You know, how are they going to get technolo- technical expertise? How are they going to get finance? How are they going to get markets? And when you start talking about that, that's when you're really talking about capitalism. Because capitalism, yeah. it's about social labor in terms of organizing social labor in a factory, but it's actually about organizing it in society. And when you start thinking about organizing it in society, that's when it gets really complicated. I have no trouble imagining workers running a workplace. When I get to think about, well, how do you organize a whole society democratically? I have no examples. Uh, I can think of all the problems. It's harder for sure, yeah. But it doesn't depress me. You know, it just tells me what we have to do. And if you know what you have to do, then you can start getting at it. But if you keep pretending that you've got the answer, you'll never get to thinking about what you really need to do. I mean, I think I think you picked up on a re- or you you identified a really important sort of um, limitation. I think of of cooperative movements in Canada, anyway. Which I mean, I'd certainly from my experience, there tends to be, um, you know, because it's so hard to confront capital in a sustained way. It's 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 easier to sort of pitch yourself as a service provider of of sorts in terms of like filling in the gaps of saying, oh, uh, capitalism is completely failing rural areas and they're depopulating. However, you know, the government, those local governments would like to, <laughs> you know, slow that down at least a little bit. So we'll bring in cooperatives and because they're so efficient, because they mobilize volunteerism and community resources, we'll actually be able to paper over some of the like crisis of neoliberalism, uh, which of course does nothing to address neoliberalism itself or or capitalism uh, or it's it's sort of per- pernicious effects um but in but in terms of uh of i guess the bigger the the bigger picture i mean i think again uh you know the moving from example to example is is i think i, I would totally agree that that's a a problem uh on the left both both in terms of cooperatives or you know factory takeovers and countries as you said um but i'm i I guess I'm curious. I mean, I, in my experience with the solidarity economy movements that I've sort of been connected to, I think are actually trying to to do what you've said so far, which is which is to say, okay, let's let's be pretty explicit about capitalism. Uh, let's uh, let's do things like um, and and let's find ways to insulate ourselves from the market, mostly through. I mean, there's all kinds of ingenious ways that you can that people do this. Um, you know the whole fair trade movement is one sort of very kind of, you know, it's a marginal, but, but, but still, you know, significant um, way to sort of say, okay, well, we're actually just going to pay an extra few cents a pound uh, for coffee or whatever. And then that creates space for different kinds of ways of, of, you know, slightly less exploitative uh, labor and uh, international trade to happen. Um, Or, um, or you say, okay, let's, you know, we have, uh, we have a, a housing co-op. Let's use some of the commercial space uh, in the in the housing co-op to host a business, uh, you know, that doesn't have to pay quite as much rent, so has a slight competitive advantage, and you can use that space to do things differently in terms of worker control. Or you have, uh, you know, if you have people talking about the whole value chain, like there's a worker co-op in um, in Brooklyn. We talked about the last episode of Half Past Capitalism. It was um, uh, you know, it's these these workers in central Brooklyn who are, uh, you know, working with local farms on one end and the, and the sort of mutual aid networks, um, you know, dealing with COVID on the other end. And so they're able to 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 provide sort of, you know, um, the, the full value chain of, of like growing the food, uh, maybe processing it a bit and delivering it to people who need it uh, and and using the sort of money that people are putting into these mutual aid networks to do it. Um, so, you know, which which I think is um, it, it is an interesting sort of model of of saying, okay, uh, doing the things that you 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 were saying that that should be done, but obviously the 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 difficulty is can now connecting that to okay, what's a bigger like social project of actually confronting capital and saying it's not enough just to like solve some individual problems but like how do we actually talk about or start to even conceive of taking over the whole thing um but obviously it's there's an issue of scale like we're not operating on anything like the scale of you know global capitalism the things that you write about 
Um, so I guess I'm curious, you know, people who are doing this work on a super local level at the scale that their capacity allows, at the scale that the current networks allow, what would be your advice uh, in terms of in terms of scaling up or in terms of making that applicable um, to the broader system that we find ourselves in? Yeah, so I, I guess I should make it clear that when I wrote the article, I was intent on criticizing a certain evangelism that we found the answer to these things. And it wasn't to dismiss co-ops and you know, defensive responses, et cetera. And I, I concluded with, which is where I really wanted to go, uh, is where can co-ops <clears throat> fit into a larger practice? Where, where do co-ops fit into socialism? And be honest about that. So, so when I raise these questions, I'm not raising them to dismiss co-ops. I'm raising them to say that, uh, you know, it's always, you're always trying to inspire people by saying how good something is to give them hope because people are so demoralized. But what we really need to do is ask the hard questions so we can go further. It's really the only way to go further is to be honest about asking the right questions instead of pretending that they're not there. So there's a, so there's a number of things that I think co-ops can do. I mean, you know, the, the history of co-ops in, uh, in the West, I'm from Winnipeg, and the history of co-ops in Regina and, you know, and uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba was they were intimately related to, to the left. There were socialists and communists involved in setting them up. Uh, not because having a grain co-op was socialist, but because that's how you get someplace else. You know, you, you, you raise the, the gap between people are thinking about immediate services and me thinking about the big picture. Well, the big picture doesn't get you anywhere either. You have to think about getting to where people organize and live and work. And what's the connection between the two? And the connection between the two is that uh, it's not just that capitalism robs us of all these capacities that we potentially have and that socialism promises them. What you have to fill in is what kind of capacities do we need to go from one to the other? And so I think we should think, it's not so much advice, I just think we should think about co-ops in that context. What capacities are you developing? And sometimes capacities means uh, doing something, seeing the limits of it, and then thinking about, well, how do we go beyond those limits? So I think, you know, I think you, you, may, you said some concrete things, but you know, one thing is to say, uh, you know, we can try to give people a little bit a cheaper good, and that's good. Same thing, you know, in the same way that unions are trying to get people a better wage. But the question is, why not set aside some of what the co-op is doing and saying it's actually going for organizing? We're just telling you up front, you're not going to get. This isn't your chance to get uh, a, a box of cereals for a, a nickel less. Uh, and what we mean by organizing is, uh, you know, what you said about space, for example. We have the space. We're gonna figure out how to use that space in a way that fits into organizing for socialism. We might say, we're gonna give money to organizers to go out and organize things, to work with unions and to work with other things. We might give it, we might set up a whole uh, food network and say that capitalism, the way it deals with food is really problematic. We wanna start exploring how to do it differently by making these links and organizing locally and uh, educating people all the time and running classes. And some of those classes were how do you actually run a business because we need those skills. And some of them is how do you understand capitalism? And some of them might be about strategy where you bring in organizers and you bring in unions to discuss and criticize, et cetera. So uh, you might decide that we have to be part of a socialist movement. If there's a socialist struggle going on, we're gonna be part of it. If people are talking about forming a new socialist party, we're going to be part of it because we want to make sure it's actually democratic. So it's actually thinking of yourself as part of a socialist movement. And it's hard because, you know, the temptations are just to be absorbed in making the co-op survive. That's why being part of something bigger is always kind of a check on you. You can't just say, I'm busy fixing my own little place here. Someone's saying, wait a second, that doesn't fit into the larger plan. 
So, so that's the critical thing, uh, especially at this moment when there isn't a larger plan, there isn't a larger movement. So the question is, how do we become part of building that larger movement? And how do we conscious always assess what we're doing and say, well, what's the limit? And that raises questions. It may say that, well, wait a second, free trade is not, uh, we can't do this with free trade. And we, we can't stop free trade. We can't announce, you know, our co-op just put out a, a leaf that's saying we're ending free trade. You know, what can we do? We can use uh, solidaristic trade, as you mentioned, fair trade. Uh, but ultimately, we have to actually challenge, you know, what free trade is about is the freedom of the corporations to do what they want, yeah. where they want. We have to challenge that. And we want to challenge it in a way that isn't uh, xenophobic and racist. And so what we're actually saying is, well, we think you should be doing what we're doing in those other countries too. And in fact, we'll help you do it. We'll transfer technology and knowledge. Yeah. But we can only really help you when we actually control our own society. I mean, you know, we can't transfer technology to you if we don't control it. So you begin to raise questions about the state. Well, why, we, why do we need to take over the state? Not because uh, we're gonna run the state uh, in a better way, but because we wanna transform the state. It, you know, people's suspicions about the state and the fact that they want to do something locally because they don't trust bureaucracy and all their experiences with the state are legitimate. The only reason to take over the state is to say the state is a capitalist institution. For, you know, a couple of centuries, all the skills that's developed have been about running a capitalist society. Sometimes we push them to do things a little bit more equitable, but that's what the skills basically are. They don't have the capacities to say, how do we support these people who want to take over things so they can do it better? How do we run things democratically? And so we have to think about how do you transform the state from putting pressure on it from outside, but also going inside. And so it raises the question of the state. It raises the question of international solidarity. What does it really mean? It raises the question of how do we actually take things over? So instead of saying to a third world country, we want to keep this technology from you. We're saying we want the technology not to export goods, but so we can make things for ourselves. And we want you to do the same. So we're giving it to you. You know, so so you begin to always think about the limits of what you're doing and what do you have to do to get beyond those limits? And what does it mean strategically? And once you're doing that, there's a lot of potential because then you've got examples, you've got people who are learning, you've got people who know how to run something. And those things become possible. Let me give you one other example that we never talk about in the co-op thing. Uh, if you want to democratize things, how come we don't talk about the public sector? It's public, right? It's not just there for profits. And uh, if we talked about that, maybe there's a lot of potential there. Maybe the Department of Industry should be helping these co-ops work. Maybe that's what it should be doing. Maybe it should scrap all the stuff about subsidies to business and how they become competitive. Uh, and start thinking about how do you actually link some of these co-ops together so they get size? How do you get them in, out of their marginal ghettos into larger ones? What kind of supports do they need? What kind of training and education do they need? Uh, what should the government procurement do to support this? So it's an example. Uh, you know, Department of Labor, what you would say, we want that to think differently. You would want unions to be saying, uh, yeah, we work on, the, on housing. Why are we just doing this technical stuff? Why don't we actually think about how housing could be different? Why don't we stop seeing the poorest people that we're controlling or managing at least and actually think about how do we really help them? Uh, you know, you, so, so democratizing the public sector means you have to think about what is the relationship between the workers who work there? How do you democratize that? But part of democratizing it is it isn't yours. You have to think in class terms. That's another question. It isn't that it's your factory. It's, it belongs to all of us. You may have more of a role in running it and the immediate community may be more concerned about how it affects traffic and uh, the environment. But we also have to get our heads out of this is just ours, that we're just a group of, essentially, we wanna be the, become the capitalists. That's another problem. There's a bunch of threads I, I would love to pick up on there. I mean, and entering the state in terms of like figuring out how to engage, you know, 
taking account of one's sort of extremely limited power at this point as socialists, but uh, how to engage with, with, with the state. I'm, uh, I'm part of an organization called Courage that really struggles with that, tries to figure out how, like, you know, even within the NDP, like how do we just get them to, to like up their policy game a little bit? Like that's, that's, the, that's the horizon right now. But, but, but at the same time, trying to be like, okay, well, let's also create a long-term vision of the kind of public policy that we want, which involves like the, the kinds of things you were just talking about, like massive expansion of the public sector, democratization of the public sector, a creation of a completely different way of managing it, um, uh, using that to change, change the playing field on all kinds of different, in all, all the different economic sectors and so on. Um, but I just want to bring it back. I mean, so, an, a, a, so that's a second organization that I'm part of, which is called Friends Public Services, which has done a lot of work on trying to sort of get a toehold in terms of like starting to think about what a, what a different public sector could look like. So the Future is Public is an, a, a conference that we organized that, that talked about this, but that's, that's a parenthetical note because I want to get to another organization called SEAS, which, um, which stands for the Socialist Economy Incubation Zone, which is sort of um, we're trying to sort of embrace the the like uh, the tension, I guess, between entrepreneurship and socialism, and say like, yeah, we're socialists. We're part of like clearly the entire economic system needs to transform. But at the same time, there are a lot of people who are interested in entrepreneurship. And how do you how can how can that fit into efforts to create socialism? Um, and I think that comes down to collective entrepreneurship and creation of worker co-ops, creation of consumer co-ops even if if they're done with enough with enough intention uh and enough uh enough of a social base to maintain that intention i think um but um I do, you know, I so, so our idea is is to is to say like let's let's start to at least envision what what different sectors could look like and and holistically let's not just say like oh co-ops are the answer but it's going to be a combination of you know some kind of big public sector enterprise that's going to that's going to shape a, a set, like like the forestry sector for example like we're going to have to completely reshape the public policy when it comes to how forests are managed starting with you know indigenous nations land rights and so on but then we have to go all the way down to like the like piecework of like tree planting and like who's going to run that and how how are those workplaces going to be managed and so on um but obviously we can't just say oh it's just co-ops no it's co-ops it's a public sector it's public policy it's it's all those things that have to sort of emerge but at the same time we are saying how can entrepreneurs be part of that have fit into that bigger movement um, so that's the sort of question that we're asking and I think a useful question that I that I feel like I would like to understand more of your perspective on is kind of what are the inherent limitations? I mean, obviously you can you can create a co-op that that has an intention that does certain things, but but what are what, what are the limitations that are inherent to the form in terms of co-ops versus the labor movement? Because I think a lot of the so so the sort of counterpoint to that is I think a lot of the critiques that you have in your article, which are I, th I think really on point. Um, would also apply to the labor movement. And I would describe that to more of, you know, in the sense that the cooperatives sort of fall short of the mark in terms of supporting socialism, but, but so, so does labor in the sense that, you know, there, you know, you have the Canadian Labor Congress supporting the liberals and, uh, and making deals with bosses and, uh, and, and the private sector unions just like really being very timid politically um, and, and being far short of being socialist, not even supporting the NDP, like it's, it's, it's pretty dismal. Uh, and I think you see the same sort of like decrepit social democratic uh, tendency or cultural sort of uh, ferment or lack of ferment uh, in, in the co-op sector. So you have, you know, you have these co-ops that are these nominally democratic organizations that are being run by you know, basically sort of careerist hacks who are just sort of reflecting the world around them as opposed to aspiring to transcend uh, their their context in any way or have any bigger aspiration than sort of just managing what's already there. Um, so, so, so that's a long way of asking um, <laughs> what is, uh, you know, wh where's the line in terms of like, if, if you, um, in terms of worker cooperatives, for example, being a vital part or even the core of a labor movement versus, uh, you know, trade unions being 
the core of a labor movement? Um, is is there something that's that um, is there some sort of dividing line um, on a formal level uh, that you would see, or is some kind of limitation that co-ops have that labor unions don't, or vice versa? I mean, just te let's tease out those differences a little bit because I think that would be helpful for for people who are well, trying I, to engage. I think that's a great question. Um, I, I, let me start with unions and then end up with the co-ops. Um, unions are not socialist organizations. You can even ask whether unions are class organizations. They come out of the working class, but they don't act as class organizations. They're particular organizations. They organize, you know, they represent a group of workers who just happen to be working in the same place. They could be on the right. They can be extreme rightists. They can be anywhere. Uh, so unions are the, so the question is, well, how does, how do unions fit into social transformation? And they don't fit in by trying to make unions into socialist organizations. Where they fit in is that, uh, and I, I'm not even sure that there's anything spontaneous about workers and worker struggles that lead you to socialism. I think where they fit in is A, uh, we should be fighting to make unions into more of a class organization because it would actually make them better in terms of their own interests. Public sector unions cannot say we're going to fight for higher pensions and win unless they have the public behind them. They'll be isolated. So they have to think in more class terms or, you know, or, or work, steel workers and auto workers can't win against free trade unless they join links to put pressure on. So thinking in class terms is advancing something for unions. Uh, having unions open to some socialist ideas and even bringing socialist education in, in the best unions does happen. So that's also creating a space for it. But the important thing isn't to exaggerate what unions can do, those things they can do. And if workers are in struggle, then there's workers who are gonna be asking questions and parties organize, you know, pull them in or support them. So unions aren't, I mean, I wouldn't claim that unions are something that they can't be. They're very important because they're the most organized section of the working class. And this is where you can start developing socialist ideas, but you would need another structure to do it. So that's unions. If the question is uh, the NDP, my criticism is of another nature. They're a political organization, but I don't think they have anything to do with socialism, frankly. And the reason I say that is they're, you know, they want to do progressive things, and you know reforms are important, and you know you can see people supporting them. But you know I, I once gave a talk in Alberta on uh, something we were looking at more than a movement, less than a party. And uh, one of the leaders of the public sector, presidents of a major public sector union, came there basically to monitor and attack me because he's he, he's assuming I'm coming to attack the NDP. And I opened with saying that uh, we need something new. And this isn't an attack on the NDP because the NDP has nothing to do with it. It's about socialism. And he actually liked it. He was relieved. He could leave him go and do his thing in the NDP. And the reason I say that is, isn't because the NDP, and you know, it's a good discussion we could have with courage. It isn't because the NDP isn't radical enough in its policies, although it isn't. It's that the NDP doesn't actually believe that workers can change the world. And if you don't believe that, then you'll never change the world, A, and they don't believe they can, they're awed by how big capitalism is. They don't believe you can change the world, which means that the party's role for them isn't to educate workers, organize them, create independent structures that they can fight through. They see all those things as a threat. It's hurting us electorally. When we had the days of action, the NDP was having problems with us talking about street politics, because maybe people would get involved in street politics instead of just voting. So, so the NDP, it's a different criticism. It's that their politics is not actually about transforming the world. So then you get to the co-ops. And my problem in the co-ops isn't uh, the question of uh, people wanting to develop a new kind of entrepreneurship. I think we need that. I think, you know, I think we need to actually think through and develop, well, what, is the, what does social entrepreneurship actually mean? And how do you, how do you sustain it? in a capitalist environment. And how do you get beyond? You can do it on the margins. I mean, this you can do. 
you know, Marx had the great line on co-ops because he, he talked about co-ops representing within the womb of capitalism, the seeds of something different. But then he went on to say, but it is within capitalism and that limits it being the seeds of, you know, sustaining that. So, so, so co-ops are fine in the abstract. The question is, how do you actually make them seeds of something different? And that means, which gets to the criticism, which, and that means that it isn't just a question of how do you grow this? It's a question of being honest about its limits, the pressures to become an entrepreneur like everybody else, the pressures to say, well, workers aren't interested in saying we're going to put some of our money into organizing. They want the cheaper product. Well, how do you deal with that? The pressures of saying, well, we have to think about the state. How do we change the state? We have to think about limiting capitalist power. We have to think not just about carving out something on the margins, but challenging them. You know, Quebec Solidaire, uh, not Quebec Solidaire, I'm sorry, the, the Solidarity Fund in Quebec had a program that they sold as moving towards uh, worker control. It wasn't. What it was about was telling workers, we'll give you a tax break if you put money into a fund that will be go to supporting Quebec business and nowhere was there the criteria that they have to be unionized. They have to do socially useful things. They have to be good on the environment. It was a way of integrating workers, but what it was really about is workers at that moment were criticizing finance. They were raising in Quebec the question of taking over finance. This was a diversion. Leave them alone and go off and do your own thing. So, so the issue in the, in the co-op movement isn't that co-ops are bad in the same way that unions aren't bad. It's that the limits in the union are about what they are about. And the question is, uh, can co-ops become something larger by fitting into a socialist movement? And I think there the question is, as with unions, that there has to be a socialist movement that's kind of a check and pushing co-ops to be socialist, to, to be inventing a new kind of social entrepreneurship, to fitting into education and you know, to be educating about business, but also about, you know, the limits. And it's the same with unions. If unions aren't going to be transformed, I think, until there are socialists working in unions. And even then, they're not going to make them into socialist organizations, but into organizations that are more open to socialism. Does that answer your question? Or does it get to answering your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, that's a lot to take in. It's, it's, uh, I mean, it, it feels like the the issue at every, no matter what your sort of uh, sphere of operation is, whether it's co-ops or unions or the public sector or the state, like the, the goal is to kind of keep your eyes on the prize. Uh, yeah. you know, and, 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 and what I'm hearing from you anyway is that is that there needs to be, yeah, there needs to be some other reference point that's independent of all those of all the thing, of all the co-optive pressures in all those different areas, and which um, which can which can kind of keep that keep yeah. that train on the track. Can basically. I just emphasize that? Yeah, I think what you just said is very important. Uh, uh, when you said something independent of them, and I think that's critical. It isn't just kind of moralizing and saying to unions you should be better, or to co-ops you should be more socialist. That's part of the process. But you have to have some kind of a structure that embodies that, that they're linked to. And it's a mutual thing. They're pressuring, that body is pressuring them to say, wait a second, you guys are falling into a trap. Whereas the co-op is being grounded. It's saying, yeah, well, wait a second. You can't just have these abstract conversations. And you know, your own personal work is obviously trying to link those three things. I, I should say, uh, you know, I visited, uh, incubation centers in Spain. I think it was in Madrid, I can't remember. Uh, and it was very impressive. It, I, you know, there were art, art, art incubation centers and just things for daily use, plumbing, everything. Uh, and it was impressive. You know, it, it was very impressive. You see what people can do and the social relations at work were better, but they were pretty marginalized. They'd be these small places. You know, I remember try, having to, how hard it was to find them where they were just physically, you know, I didn't know the city, but, you know, I had to keep asking people, do you know about this? Is there something like this in your community? And, uh, 
yeah, so it's always a question of, well, what do we get out of it then? What we get out of it is we begin to think of alternative ways of doing things. But when we really become political is when we ask, what else do we have to do to make this really work? Because that's always the question. You can find these little spaces to do things under capitalism that escape some of its rules. But we always have to ask, how do we spread the message? How are we honest about the limits? How do we have political discussions about them? And that's what's so important. A lot to think about there. That's 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 great. Um, yeah, I mean, what what really strikes me about what you just said is is the sort of dynamic uh, interplay I think between the sort of on the ground organizing in in whatever sphere and the and the need to create and and the need to have that sort of I guess I don't know is it, is it inherently abstract that discussion about about the future of socialism and kind no, of, no I, I mean it's abstract. Um, but, but, I mean, I don't mean yeah, it's tell abstract. me more about that. Yeah. No, no, I don't mean it's abstract because it's actually the most concrete thing you can do. If you don't, if you don't convince people that another world is could work, well, why would they fight for it? If you know if their attitude is well, socialism is impossible. You're you're assuming these great human beings and all this stuff and all these capacities and stuff. No, it's it's not. It's it's actually concrete. It's part of making people feel like well, it's possible. You don't have to prove it can work. You just have to say it's credible. Isn't it worth fighting for something that's actually credible? credible, something that's possible, not inevitable, no guarantees, but it's possible. Do you want to do that? Because if you don't want to do that, you'll never get engaged in that struggle. You'll give up long before you get there. So, so it's not abstract. Uh, no, I just mean it's more distant. It, it's not part of your daily life. And, and that's always the question. How do you, you know, the, the daily life is concrete, but because it's so concrete, it's also limited. And how do you link this to these bigger questions. So they're, they're all concrete questions. You know, the question of socialism is, how do you build a socialist party? How do you create workers who actually want socialism? How do you actually win power? What do you do with power when you win it? These are big questions. Uh, and daily life doesn't lead to you asking them. You know, daily life may lead to saying, I want my grievance answered. So socialists are there to link these questions and it's a hard thing to do. And and. I'm not just saying that co-ops need socialists. It works both ways. Socialists need to be grounded. So they learn how to talk to people and they learn what the real problems are. So, you know, all of that is critical. I should say before we go, I have one, you know, as you talk about these three things that you're working on personally, I think it'd be great for you to have somebody from each, you know, which you embody yourself, to have somebody from each of those sections uh, debating these questions. Have somebody from the co-ops and uh, from the incubation movement and from Courage or from other socialist organizations, have them on a panel uh, talking to each other and uh, in a comradely way. And I, I think that would be a really interesting conversation. And I think it would go places. Yeah, I mean, it's a that that's definitely that's definitely a challenge that I would like to take on. It's 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 more difficult than it sounds. I think <laughs> to get people who are you know. Yeah. Uh, I think that there's a lot of caricaturing that happens sort of yeah. in all the different spaces. And so finding the people who are sort of thoughtful and receptive enough yeah. to have those conversations is, is a challenge. But I think, I think as you identified, yeah, I think, a, I think, really, I think a really you, worthy one. I think you're right. It, it might, you know, I think you'd want to have a series of meetings so that people actually go back and think about what they said and maybe come back and reframe it. And also there's a certain amount of rambling that goes on when you're just meeting each other and people talk past each other. They're just kind of trying to make their points rather than really respond. But I think it's an interesting project. And, and, and just, just uh, maybe this is too giant a question, but I'll, I'll throw it out there anyway, just because, um, but, to, but to end on is, you know, it, it seems like it's very challenging to create, I mean, like, the, the, like, like you were saying, it's like, it's the sort of central challenge is to create sort of that space where we can talk about socialism and organize for it and and keep that vision uh you know and and also organize in a grounded way toward it um but but that seems to just that seems like very difficult uh you know there are socialist parties all over the world that are, <laughs> that are just implementing neoliberal policy uh and you know and and in some in some cases transitioning very quickly from being you know the sort of very idealistic to the um to the you know concretely 
retrograde. Um, do you do you have any sort of observations uh, that you could leave us with in terms of like what how to address those challenges? What anything any any glimmers of hope in terms of ways to to do that in a way that that is more successful that is more sustained? Well, I would start by saying I haven't been able to make that happen. And, you know, this is difficult. I mean, you know, we should have some humility in thinking about this. You know, the, you know, we think about the defeat over the last 30 or 40 years of the working class, but it's also been a defeat of uh, socialists. Uh, and uh, I, I'd say a few things about it. W one is that for most of uh, socialism's history, uh, it was easier because it looked like we had answers. You know, Marx writes the Communist Manifesto and you can cheer that on, well, this is what we need to do. And then you get the explosion of trade unionists who are linked to socialist ideas and you get communist parties, you get social democratic parties. Um, and in fact, what was going on was we had illusions about how to make it. So we might've felt comfortable because we said, oh, you have to join the communist party or whatever it was. Well, it wasn't the answer. And that's one of the things that we learned. And that's a hard thing to learn because all of a sudden we have a whole generation, a couple of generations now, who are living through moments when there's no obvious answer. And on the one hand, that's depressing. On the other hand, we should learn from it. Well, the other answers weren't actually the real answers. So at least now we know we don't have an answer and now we have to work on it. Um, I think there's some promises in, in the sense that a lot of the movements that thought that movements were the answer have actually be, moved towards politics. This is a really interesting development and it's new. Podemos, you know, Syriza, Corbyn, Sanders. This is a phenomenal thing for all their limits. They actually are posing, putting social, uh, political questions on the agenda. So that's positive. Uh, Neoliberalism is failing to answer all the promises it made. Just make these sacrifices and you'll be okay. So the openings are phenomenal. It really is an organizational question because I used to, have, you know, in the 60s, we used to run around trying to tell people that capitalism wasn't a good thing uh, because they were getting things from it as consumers, but we we're telling them how exploited they were in the workplace. I don't meet any workers who you have to tell that capitalism sucks anymore. They know it. The problem is they don't think you can do anything about it. That's why the structures become so important. They have to believe that there's a way of doing something. So that's what we're struggling with. How do you, how do you link up with workers again? How do you get hope again? Uh, I think it's gonna have to do with a lot of failures where you try something. And the question is always to learn from it, not to pretend that you got the answer. Do it, try it. You will not get there if you're not linked to doing things. You're not gonna figure this out sitting in a room. Uh, and same with education, you know, doing education with workers, uh, you have to do it and see what works and what doesn't work. And you learn from it. So I, I think we should just think of this in terms of we're at this very hard moment. Nobody has figured it out. Don't be down on yourself because wherever you are, you can look to other countries and see they haven't figured out it either. But we're all kind of struggling to get there. And what we have to keep, and it's a long-term thing, you know, the destruction of socialists in England in those working class communities, that was a cultural phenomenon. That wasn't just some good people with good politics. And restoring it is gonna take generations of living there, working there, talking, learning. So we're in the middle of a long process and we should see it as a long process. And we should see it as there are positive things happening and we should see it as, well, how do we learn from it and build on it? And it's gonna happen beyond our own lifetimes which is a hard thing to accept, but kind of makes life worth living. What else is there to do with your life than to become part of something larger and bigger uh, and that crosses our own, you know, goes beyond our own lives. So, you know, I feel optimistic about all the things we could learn. You know, right now in the States, there's a lot of questions about what the Democratic Socialists of America should do. Should they go into the Democratic Party? Should they stay out? Uh, and it's, those are the kind of debates we have to have and learn from them and also learn how to do them in a comradely way. Because if you start with humility, the opening point is that we actually don't know is one thing, but we have learned a lot. So we shouldn't just say, well, anything is okay. Any idea everybody had, we should argue our ideas out because some of them stink, but we should kind of respect the fact that there's no 
answer. So we're always learning. We're all learning. It's about the most I can say. Sam Gindin, thank you so much for coming on the program. Yeah. Um, just as a as a kind of a coda, is there anything uh, anywhere that or anything in particular that you think people should read or follow online or um, or look up? No, no, I, I can't think of anything. You know, just off the, off the top of my head, there's so many. There, there are a lot of good things to read. Uh, Leo Panis just died. Uh, Leo Leo made a an enormous contribution in terms of thinking about. Uh, being a socialist, what it means. Uh, but he thought very much about uh, it means engaging the state. It means transforming the state, not just taking it over. Otherwise, governments take over and they just become part of the state, in fact. It means you need agency. And he never romanticized the working class. He knew that agency was something that had to be made and developed, which meant a political party. And then he, you know, raised all the questions about the limits of political parties and how we have to learn from them. So reading his work, I think, is sobering because he doesn't give you any easy answers. But I find them, you know, I think that they're also inspiring. Asking the difficult questions and being honest can actually be inspiring. And it's actually the only way we'll ever win. So yeah, check out Leo's work. That's an uh, excellent note to end on. Um, thanks again. Great. Okay.